Dr. Craig Gore is the executive director of the Watershed Watch Salmon Society. This month he is one of the experts making presentations to the Cohen Commission of Inquiry into the decline of sockeye salmon in the Fraser River. He is the chair of the Pacific Marine Conservation Caucus and science coordinator of the Coastal Alliance for Aquaculture Reform. His postgraduate degrees are in wildlife ecology and behavioral ecology. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Craig Orr to Studio 4 to tell us more. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Interesting eco times we're living in. <laughs> Uh, that could, could be an understatement. <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, the Cohen Commission, uh, structured why? The Cohen uh, Commission has been going for a while. It was actually uh, formed in, in November of 2009, and it's been meeting for several months now. And uh, it has, I believe, three mandates. One is to look into the causes of declines of Fraser uh, River sockeye, and they've been declining steadily since 1992. It's a, st it's a downward trend in, in productivity or their ability to replace themselves. It's looking at the, uh, the reasons why. Uh, it's looking at all kinds of different factors, and there's been testimony over the months <laughs> which we've attended on uh, things like predators, uh, fishing mortality, en route mortality, and most recently mm -hmm. salmon farming, but quite a few other things. There's been lots of reports commissioned, and it's looking to make recommendations on how to prove the sustainability of sockeye and also uh, changes in policy and management uh, around sockeye. Mm -hmm. And there is something quite startling that uh, uh, started it, sparked it, I think, because uh, in, was it 2009, they expected something like 11 million salmon, give or take, to return to the Fraser, and only 1 million sockeye yes. showed up. Yeah, a very disastrous return. Now, historically, preseason forecasts overestimate fish uh, mm. coming back. Uh, they're not very reliable. Uh, but. Uh, these these uh, returns were so far out of, of preseason forecasts that, and, and coupled with the declining trend, uh, mm -hmm. it, it triggered uh, government at that time. Uh, we we met with the fisheries minister in Ottawa, Watershed Watch did, and, and the David Suzuki Foundation. We asked for an inquiry as well, and we got it. So we're we're getting towards the end of it right now. But uh, Justice Cohen, who's leading it, uh, has quite a job in front of him mm -hmm. trying to sort through all the evidence. Uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice Cohen. Yes. Let's go back to uh, Science 101. Uh, salmon, who uh, don't live all that long, but it seems when they, when they come home to spawn, uh, they are, have a her Herculean <laughs> journey, really. Tell me how it works. Well, we'll focus on sockeye. You know, they have a four-year life cycle. They'll, they'll come in to spawn and, uh, the next, in fall, and uh, you know, summer through fall, uh, they'll, they'll lay their eggs and uh, the eggs will emerge from the gravel uh, of the streams, natal streams in the spring. And then the, uh, the juveniles move to a lake where they'll stay for a year to grow larger and, and, mm -hmm. and increase their chances of survival. So the decline, uh, you know, the, the disastrous return in 2009, those, those fish would have gone out to sea as smolts uh, in 2007 and spent that time in the ocean getting fatter and then they came back in 2009. So that's a typical life history of, of a sockeye. And, they, and does the sockeye always come back to the same river? They generally come back to the same river. They have a high fidelity to, you know, coming back, homing back. They use lots of cues, chemical mm -hmm. cues, olfactory cues to come back to those rivers. There's some strain, but generally they come back. And there are uh, many distinct spawning populations of sockeye in the Fraser River, and some are very strong uh, still, and some are, are very weak. Do we know why? We don't know why. It's generally a mosaic, but there's there's... For instance, a lot of our returns lately have been from the Chilco and Quinell rivers. Uh, mm. Chilco sockeye uh, have been studied quite extensively by Professor Scott Hinch at UBC, and he calls them the super sockeye of, of the Fraser. They have the largest hearts. Mm. They have the uh, most uh, fusiform body for swimming. They have the highest temperature tolerances of all sockeye. So they do quite well compared to some of the other sockeye. And uh, I think we have seven or eight populations of sockeye in the Fraser that are listed as threatened or endangered at this point. So it's a mixture. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, we tend to focus on the stronger stocks and, and not so much on the weaker stocks. I was reading an article in Scientific American, and uh, uh, the writer coined the phrase, or somebody coined the phrase, uh, dead fish swimming. That they were in such bad shape, some of the sockeye uh, trying to come back, they uh, were uh, um, immunodepressed, probably, mm -hmm. vulnerable to pathogens, disease. True? Yes. True enough. And, uh, you know, this isn't the first time we've had problems with sockeye, but right. it's been a steady decline. 
1994, 1 1.3 million uh, went missing, and we had uh, we had a review uh, chaired by the Honorable John Fraser. In 2004, right. 1 1.3 million again uh, went missing, and we had a review again that looked at things like thermal impacts. But I think the recent science is really starting to, uh, you know, shed more light on it. So what we've seen since 1992 is an early return of sockeye uh, to the Fraser River system, early migration. Uh, actually, that started in 1996. But uh, uh, Dr. Christy Miller, who's a geneticist with the Department mm -hmm. of Fisheries and Oceans, is the one who's really providing a lot of evidence at Cohen and, and a lot of insight on what's going on. She started looking not at disease in sockeye, but why were they coming back early? Uh, why were they all of a sudden coming back to the river early, mm -hmm. uh, sitting in very warm water and subjecting themselves to large amounts of pre-spawn mortality. She started looking at en route mortality, pre-spawn mortality, and what she found is what is a real trigger for a lot of what we're, we're hearing at Cohen now. She found uh, a viral signature in these sockeye, and she published her results recently in Science, which is a, a premier journal of, of science in the world. Right. And uh, what she suspects is that there's some virus that uh, these fish are picking up, a viral signature, and uh, uh, causing this large amount of pre-spawn mor mortality. These fish are 16 times more likely to die in the river, and uh, up to 95% of these fish will die before they actually get back to the spawning grounds or successfully spawn. So she's trying to find, she's trying to isolate this virus now, and she hasn't been able to, uh, but uh, the Cohen inquiry heard, and it, it caused lots of gasp, that uh, she mm -hmm. doesn't have a dedicated budget uh, to look at this virus from right DFO, now. from Department DFO, or from outside sources. Right now, there's questions on whether she can accept money from outside sources. And uh, you know, here we are, such a salmon-centric uh, mm -hmm. province. And in fact, we just did a poll uh, to prove that we're very salmon-centric. And uh, our lead geneticist, who has this evidence of a virus affecting Fraser River sockeye, the mainstay of our commercial fishery, doesn't have the money to figure out why at this point. That's shocking. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So back to where this virus, it, well, I know you're not the scientist on the project, no. but uh, there's lots of speculation uh, between ecologists and scientists and environmentalists, all of the above. So what do they think? Well, uh, I testified last week on the impacts of sea lice. That's what I've been working on, mostly in the Broughton over the past 10 years. Mm. And uh, we've been on farms and we're looking at growth of lice and, and transfer. We certainly see lots of lice on sockeye, Fraser River sockeye. We did the DNA of juvenile sockeye passing fish farms in the Strait of Georgia. They first start picking up around Quadra Island. And uh, we did a study that was just published earlier this year, uh, some co-authors and I. And we found that once a sockeye, juvenile sockeye, passed a fish farm, it had lots more lice than before it got to the fish farm. And we compared those levels with Skeena sockeye, juvenile sockeye, mm -hmm. where they passed by nose farms. And it's an order of magnitude higher amount of lice from the salmon farms. The same lice that's on the sockeye is found on the salmon farms. Uh, but the numbers of lice we're finding probably aren't indicative of you know, the pathogenetic effect of these lice. They're probably debilitating the fish. They cause them to be caught more quickly by predators. But the issue that we're looking at, and we think DFO needs to look at, is that lice are vectors of disease from salmon farms. They can transfer disease from salmon farms. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the focus at Cohen has been what diseases are on salmon farms? What do we know about diseases? We have seen things like marine anemia on Chinook salmon farms where sockeye pass by in the Strait of Georgia. But the whole story is still unraveling at this time. And where do the out. salmon fa farmers fit into the picture? I assume they're talking to Cohen Commission too or not? Absolutely, they've been on the stand as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there's been lots of questions on, on how they report their diseases, what diseases they're looking at. There's been several reports commissioned on the, the potential impacts of salmon farms, and the authors were on the stand for three days at Cohen, uh, you know, talking about their reports. And there's, there's lots of evidence that decline of sockeye is related to the numbers of farm fish along their migration route, but it's also related to sea surface temperatures, related to the number of pink salmon in the ocean. Pink salmon compete with juvenile sockeye for food. So it may be, uh, it may be that we, we can't isolate one cause uh, uh, in terms of sockeye declines, but I think what we need to see out of this commission is more uh, focused on, on good science. We also need to see a focus on the conflicted mandate of fisheries and oceans. That's come up all the way through the Cohen inquiry. Mm -hmm. They are promoting salmon farming on one side and protecting wild fish on the other side. And there's evidence presented all the way through Cohen that this is causing quite a conflict of interest within DFO. Is there a middle? Is there a way to contain the salmon farms, put them on land? I know there's been 
Absolutely. <laughs> many, <laughs> many ideas. And groups like you know, the Coastal Alliance Rock Culture Reform and Watershed Watch have been advocating for this mm -hmm. for quite a while. Uh, there are some farms uh, going up. There, the Namgus First Nation is, is building a land-based farm, uh, you know, up by Alert Bay. Is uh, it more expensive? Yeah, well, it depends on how you do your economics. Okay. Right now, we're, we're being told by many in the industry that it's too expensive to do, but, of course, they're externalizing their costs. Uh, you know, the feces from the fish goes mm -hmm. into the ocean. The viruses and diseases pass from wild to farm fish and, and, and back and forth. And so if you look at full cost accounting, it's actually a better idea to take the fish out of the migration routes of, of the juvenile fish. Uh, you know, you have to consider the loss of, of wild salmon. So if we do that full cost accounting, it's a much better idea to take the fish out of the ocean, the open net pens, and put them on land, mm -hmm. mark them as a premium product. There's been quite a few studies done showing that uh, you know, this is working around the world now. Alexander Morton, I'm sure, has testified, yay nay, Absolutely. at the Cohen Commission. Where does she stand with what you believe? Uh, do you agree with her? Do you disagree with her? Well, we're on the same page in, in, in many cases with Alex. In fact, we looked at a lot of the evidence. There's more than 6,000 documents uploaded to a secure database uh, that we all had to sign an undertaking to examine. Probably about 2,000 of those have been put in evidence. So we've been chatting with Alex quite a bit about the mm -hmm. disease records. We were able to work with her and, and, uh, and, and members of our conservation coalition. We're represented by Ecojustice at the Cohen Inquiry. Right. And uh, we uh, got all the all the salmon uh, disease and, and uh, sea lice databases and the government audits of those databases uh, entered into evidence, although we had a bit of fight. We had uh, a fair bit of fighting to, uh, to go through to get those, those uh, databases entered in, so we're still mm. looking at them right sure. now. Sure. What is the resistance? Where is it coming from? Obviously, if you have a salmon farm and it's, it's uh, there and you're making money, there would be some resistance, but long-term thinking the wild salmon are the most important, no question. Well, you have to... I, Ask I, a bear. <laughs> the question that still remains is why is government so supportive of the industry? Uh, that, you know, they, they are supporting uh, industry advocacy groups, uh, you know, compared to things like the wild salmon policy, for instance, the most progressive mm -hmm. policy the Federal uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans has. It talks about a blueprint for protecting wild salmon, but has no dedicated funding. It has no, no, no budget from year to year. But uh, there's, there's millions of dollars put into the promotion of aquaculture, and, and I think we need to look at, at the answer to that, and, mm -hmm. and we don't really know why. Because we can figure out why sockeye stocks are unstable, but if the fish are still not coming home to spawn, we still have an issue. We still have an issue. Hmm. Dr. Craig R., our guest, he's an ecologist. He is the chair of uh, several organizations, but, but mainly the Watershed Watch Salmon Society. We'll come back. <laughs>